What is the difference between bad behavior and mental illness? I'm Nicolene Peck and I teach all over the world about parenting, good communication, how to build strong family relationships, all through the lens of the principle self-government. And in this video, we're answering the question, is it behavior problem or are we dealing with mental illness? <laughs> In this video, we're going to be talking about some of the common misconceptions that people have when they're trying to determine that difference between behavior and mental illness. And then we're going to talk about what the difference actually is so that you can make sure you can assess better for yourselves. And also we'll take it a step further and even give you things that you can do even if you are dealing with mental illness. We've probably all been there. We've met a person or we've been observing something, maybe even in our own child or our own spouse, and we're wondering, okay, is this something that was like a learned behavior? Is this because of the way they've been raised? Is this because somebody taught them this? Or is something else going on, right? I think that people are more concerned about mental health nowadays than they ever have been before. And I think that's because we understand more about mental health than we ever have before. But we have to be really careful about that because I think there are many people that just go around diagnosing other people like, oh yeah, that's ADHD, you're probably ADHD. I have so many people that come to me and say, you know, my child was getting diagnosed with ADD and I think I have ADD. And I'm like, okay, well maybe, or maybe there's a behavioral component there where the family behaves in a certain way and it's been groomed, right? Because that can be a case too. So sometimes you can have one person in a family, could be a parent, could be a child, that has a mental health issue that people aren't fully aware of. But then all of the other siblings say, or you know, maybe children of the parents start to develop some of the same tendencies as that person. Then someone could maybe assume that the entire family has the mental health problem, when in reality, it's actually a learned behavior because it's part of the environment. So some of our behavior is environmental, right? And we can develop habits that create certain behaviors. So what happens then is it makes it very difficult for us to determine sometimes, is this nurtured or is this nature? Is this just how that person is? Now, we might have to ask ourselves sometimes, does it really matter? When we're working with someone outside of our family unit, someone that we really don't have as much of an opportunity to help, we don't have to worry as much if, if this is how they were nurtured or if this is their nature. What usually we just need to figure out is how do we handle it with compassion and understanding? And maybe the best way to assume is that there is something different about the person so that we don't start just thinking of the person as someone who's constantly mean. So when someone has a mental health issue, there is something that is chemically different about that person. They are processing in a different way, not because they have been nurtured to do so, but because of other things. All right, we're going to talk more about the difference and what you can do to help. But first, do you see that button that says subscribe? Click it now. When you click that button, you get to see more of these videos. And if you click the notification bell, then you'll be notified when new content comes out. Click the subscribe button now. So when you're trying to determine if something is behavioral or if it might actually be a mental health thing, there are a couple of things you're going to want to consider. Number one is if it is behavioral, then it's usually situational or habitual. Now it is true that a person who's dealing with mental health issues does develop habits and will behave a certain way in certain situations, but they will also think in those same patterns, not in a situation where behavior might come out 
in the same way that they're displaying it. So if a person truly has depression, they are going to be having depressive thoughts when it's not a situation that would normally lead to depression. They are going to be beating themselves up, being hard on themselves, secluding themselves, wanting to spend more time in bed when there's not really a noticeable reason for it. So that's why people say things like there's situational depression and then there's actual clinical depression, which is a mental health condition. Obviously all depression affects our overall mental health, but when people talk about mental health conditions, what they are saying is they are saying this person chemically is predisposed to process this way and they have to work extra hard to decide not to process that way. Where a normal person who experiences a sadness, a setback, a letdown, and they might have situational depression, that is now the unusual way to process and they can get back to a baseline that does not involve depression. Do you see the difference there? So situational is the thing that you want to ask yourself. Is this situational? Am I noticing this during a situation that most people would display depression? If so, then possibly it's situational depression, in which case it's still a mental health struggle a person is going through, but it's a little bit more on the behavioral side of things, which means they can do more behaviorally to adjust it in a quicker fashion. And they, and you can appeal a little bit more to their cognitive reasoning abilities to help them out of the circumstance. But if a person has a mental health processing really an abnormality, but it's their normal. Okay. And they process things with that normal. That's not like everybody else is normal. And so you're seeing it in a situation, maybe that depression you see in a situation or that anxiety you see in a situation, but you're also seeing it at other times when that doesn't seem to be a clear reason for why they would have that anxiety. Then you know that it's probably more of a clinical mental health circumstance and they are having chemical or processing differences where they are getting stuck in a certain place in their processing and it's going to require a little bit more work for them. It's also going to be harder for you to appeal to that prefrontal cortex and it's going to take more patience and more work for you too as you're trying to help them. So the number one thing you want to ask yourself is, is it situational or not? Now, another thing that you can determine is, okay, is this a habit that might have been formed by another person that we can see around us? So if you look at the group of people around you and you say, okay, well, this person also does that every single time they eat or every single time they're with other people. They have this thing where they feel like they just really have to wash their hands. So now this child that is really consumed with washing their hands, do they have the same OCD that their parent has or have they just learned it because there's another person within the environment that also has the same behavior? So if there are multiple people within the environment that have a shared shared behavior, then your chances go up that it might be behavioral grooming and habit forming as opposed to being an actual mental health condition. The third factor that you might want to consider is, is this behavior easily adjusted? Okay. So if you appeal to a person's prefrontal cortex, their cognitive ability, and you can help them adjust the behavior pretty simply, then likely it's just behavioral. Now that still means it could be a habit. It could be a behavior habit, which means that it's their go-to. They've got a track in their brain that goes straight to that behavior every single time. And you're still going to have to have consistent teaching to help them through that, especially if they're younger because their prefrontal cortexes are not as fully developed because their prefrontal cortexes are so small. So 
what you need to determine is, did this get solved with good teaching? Now that doesn't mean that a person with mental health issues cannot have some good results when you're trying to help them and teach them and correct them through some of these habits that quite frankly are making life difficult for them. But usually their process is going to be more difficult. It's going to be more slow. They are going to feel like I can't I can't when in reality, you know, they can, if they just hold on to the right thought. Now don't get confused with some children who use manipulative tactics by saying, I can't, I can't do it to try to get the, the parent to make all the changes. So you see how difficult it can be to fully assess if a person is making excuses because they've learned, Hey, this is an easy way out. Or if it's for real that they are having a mental health issue, but these are three factors that you can hopefully join together to try to determine if this might be something that you need to seek mental health help for or not. Now, whether you're dealing with a mental health issue with a colleague, a spouse, or significant other, or a child, or not, whether it's behavioral or mental health related, the good news is the answer is the same for moving forward. Now, obviously, if you know it's a mental health problem, you're going to show a little bit more patience and understanding. You should always have patience and understanding, but you will be able to have a little bit more of that because you'll have better understanding of what's going on inside the person. But regardless of if the person has a mental health condition or not, you need to appeal to the prefrontal cortex understand, don't power struggle and appeal to the prefrontal cortex. That means that you want to use logic, but not lecture when you are trying to help a person who is having a struggle with their behavior, whether it's associated with mental health or not. So now we get to the, the part that I'm the most excited about, which is, so what do you do to appeal to that prefrontal cortex? Well, first off you talk about their processing with them. You talk about situations that you've seen and what they think and do during those times, help them to do some self analysis so that they have a better chance of finding the place where they can change their thought process in the future. Then you're going to give them something that every person needs. And that is a skill. So I teach skills all over this channel. There are videos about teaching skills skills to children and parents and other people, because we all rely on skills. In fact, if what you're doing right now leads to a fight, then you know, your skills are not working because you do have skills. You've created them for yourself, but maybe those skills are based in coercion instead of principles like freedom, understanding, calmness and good problem solving. So what you do is you teach them a skill and say, we are going to use this skill or these skills. Cause I believe there are four basic skills that handle the majority of bad behavior problems. And then you say, okay, now let's plan for how we will correct the problem. There are better ways to correct a problem than others. If you're a parent, you can set this up very simply and say, this is the skill that I'm going to use to correct you. These are the exact words that I'm going to say. These are the tone elements that I'm going to employ. And by the way, you can find out how to do all of that in my course at teachingselfgovernment.com. But if you're working with someone that you don't have direct authority over because maybe they're a peer, a colleague or a spouse, then what you need to do is you need to understand some key components to doing a good correction. So basically that correction skill helps you. You're just not going to do all the steps. The first three steps to a correction are going to be your best friend. Also, you're going to want to understand the parenting skill pre teaching and praising because you'll want to help teach cause and effect to that person who, when they are in the wrong part of their brain or being steered by the wrong chemical are having a hard time seeing the cause and effect in the circumstances around them. I have so many resources that are made, especially for you in help with this question. One of those resources is my TSG parenting course. 
If you go to teachingselfgovernment.com and you go to the shop tab, you will find the TSG parenting course. That 10 module course is changing people's lives all over the world. People are finding freedom, connection and unity, understanding, increased patience, as well as consistency and firmness in their interactions with their children and other people in their lives. This whole course is about freedom, liberation, so that you and your loved ones don't have to have that emotional bondage that is currently controlling your interactions and creating distance in your relationships. So go to teachingselfgovernment.com and find the TSG parenting course today. Get started whether you're a parent or not. The principles presented in that course will help you learn self-government for all of your relationships. I'll see you there.